Hey guys, welcome to the Clock Shack. And today I'm gonna to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, I know most of my following is here for the lasers, but a lot of you guys, not only do you do lasers, but you do woodworking, you do miscellaneous projects. And I got something that I wanna share with you. This is a part of the process uh, and part of how I support my tool addiction and buy tools and keep things going around the shack here. Uh, is I have a customer and I sell stove covers to this to this customer. Well, the customer is a corporate customer. They have a, uh, a uh, manufactured home business where they sell manufactured homes. And they reached out to me for housewarming gifts and stuff to give to people when they buy a home uh, as a personalized gift for them. And uh, they had seen my stove covers that I had built for some individuals that were on my webpage. And so that's what they asked for me to, to, to make for them. Now, being that this is a, uh, a corporate customer, a, a repeat customer, uh, my pricing is substantially lower than what I would sell them to to the general public. But I make about $75 per unit buying the lumber to make these. I'll make $75 back. And typically it takes me maybe two days to build like you know five of them. Uh, and that's just working at a moderate pace, trying to do videos and stuff like that in between. So if you're out there and you're looking for ways of making money, today I'm gonna walk you through the process where you don't have to have a sawmill because unfortunately for me, I have got to the point to where I can't keep up with the demand by myself between milling the lumber, drying the lumber, and then making the stove covers. I had to cut out part of the process and the only part that I could cut out was the actual milling of the lumber. So I've had to go to, you know, get sourcing my lumber elsewhere and it's costing me like 22 to 24 dollars a board uh, and so I'm going to show you how to start with a uh, traditional one by ten pine and end up making these stove covers which you can engrave sell as a custom piece and like I said my basically wholesale price that I'm selling them for is a hundred dollars each uh, for outside people outside of that, you could actually go higher. Uh, specialty woods go way higher, but this is just for a, a basically a standard build pine stove cover. And I'm gonna share with you my dimensions. I'm gonna share with you the process. We're gonna walk it through all the way from board to finished product, and we'll try to make a video out of it today uh, and share it with you. Cause I've had, uh, recently I've had two more realtors reach out to me, want me to, to take them on board doing the same thing as well as a home builder has reached out and asked me to do it for them. Uh, they do, you know, built in place homes, uh, new construction type stuff. So right now, in my area at least, building homes, purchasing homes, the, the, the real estate market and building homes is just crazy right now. So if you're like me, small business, trying to find a little bit of a foothold to get some regular income that you can count on, then this might be something you want to look at because I've, like I said, I've turned down three customers in the past two weeks that wanted me to do for them what I'm doing for my other customer, but I just cannot support it by myself. I don't have the time. And so I've had to, to had to pass on that. So uh, this may be something you're interested in. If that's, if that, if that idea of being able to come up with something to sell to folks and have a continual stream of, of, of income from that appeals to you, you might want to watch the video. Uh, if not, guys, uh, if you're here for the laser stuff or whatever, then you may want to just go check out my playlist. But I appreciate you for appreciate you coming anyway. But we're going to move into the shop and I'm going to get started on it, guys. All right, guys, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear me over the uh, dust collector or not, but I'm going to be needing that guy today. So I'm gonna leave it on. Uh, the first phase of this, of course, is to cut the lumber up into the pieces that I need. And in doing so, I will be using my chop saw. And what I've gotta have is I've gotta have 32 inch. They don't have to be 32 in the end. Uh, they're actually gonna get trimmed down to 30 and a half. But what I do is I cut these boards into 32 inch sections so that I can move forward with that. So that's what I'm gonna do it right now is I'm just gonna be busting a lot of these boards down to 32 inch boards to be used.
All right, guys, on these, on this board here, this is, these are all gonna be my, my boards on my panels, all right? Uh, these are gonna be the little side boards that go on the side. Those side boards are three inch wide boards. So this is a uh, commercially available uh, one by 10, which is actually three quarter inch by nine and a quarter. So what I'm gonna be doing on this one is I'm gonna cut this one into 24 inch lengths and that gives me the length that I need to go from top to bottom on my stove covers with a little extra to make sure I get them uh, where I need them. And it makes the numbers work out because if I cut these 24 inches, I can get four boards. And then that four boards I take to the, to the table saw. And when I rip those into three inch wide pieces, that quarter of an inch gets absorbed by the table saw. And so I end up with three, three inch wide uh, pieces for the side uh, slats. If I get three out of each 24 inch board, that's gonna be four and then three wide. So that's a total of 12 boards, which makes six stove covers. And it takes three of these panels here to make one stove cover. So that should give me enough parts to make six stove covers out of this pile of lumber, which dictates to $600 for me. So <laughs> that's what we're working for here now. So I'm gonna go and cut these at 24 inches. And like I said, 24 inches is, is not where they'll end up. 24 inches is actually, they're gonna end up being 22 and a half. But I like to trim those at the end. That way I can shift one way or another if I got a knot or a blemish in the wood that I wanna get rid of. This thing seems to be working pretty well, guys, but I mean, of course, it's missing some of the saw shavings and stuff, but it's working as well as I'd hoped. Uh, my, my poor uh, chop saw needs a uh, new dust collection guard on it, but the good news is, after you're done, this thing kind of also will double as a shop vac so I can clean some of this mess up. All right, guys, it's getting crowded in the clack shack. I've got to do something about space. Uh, I keep getting more tools and more stuff, and I'm running out of places to put it. Now, remember when I cut these, I cut these, uh, these main boards. These are the panels that make consist of the, the base of the stove cover. Uh, I cut these 32 inches long. Now, they're not going to be 32 inches long on the end product, but I like to put them together, and once they're, they're, they're put together and glued up, then I like to go back and do one continual cut across all three boards so that I get those smooth edges and it helps me out on the, at, toward the end, makes it a little quicker. So what I gotta do now is in order to make my stove cover 30 and a half inches wide and 22 and a half inches tall, what I'm gonna do is each one of these boards is gonna end up being seven and a half inches uh, wide. So I take my, typically I'll take my wood because sometimes you know how it goes guys, these things aren't perfectly square, the, the edges aren't perfectly straight. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna run these shorter boards through the table saw to try to clean up and flatten those edges to make sure I get a good seam when I put the boards together and do the glue up. So let me grab my glasses because I have laid them down and uh, we'll get started on that. And yeah, I wear my laser glasses pretty much all the time. It's, it's just got to be a habit. So what I'm gonna do, but guys, is basically I'm gonna take my table saw and I'm gonna set it back to where all I'm taking off of this piece of wood is maybe like an eighth of an inch more than the width of the blade. So probably a quarter of an inch overall. And I'm gonna walk that thing down. I'm just gonna make a cut on this side and depending on how it looks when I flip it over, if it's smooth or not, then I'm just gonna move it down to seven and a half inches and uh, cut it again. And that'll make one of my panels. And then I'm just gonna lay these guys to the side in sets of three, because it takes three seven and a half inch boards to make these stove covers. So let me turn the dust collection on, because now that I got that, guys, I'm trying to keep it cleaner in here. Uh, it seems to be working. We'll find out with this table saw, because this is generally messy.
All right, guys, I got all the uh, main boards done. Now I'm gonna do the three inch strips. So all I gotta do on these is set this saw for three inches. And I'm just gonna rip them off. And there we have it, guys. That's all the cutting for now. Got to do the glue up and uh, put them together. Now the next phase is going to be, I got to get my panels glued up. I got to get biscuits put in them and get them glued up. So I'm going to move all the, all the pieces back inside and I'll bring you along once I get ready to start gluing them up. Now for the next step, guys. This step is generally really, really messy. Uh, luckily, the newest vacuum that I bought for my vacuum table came with a new hose and coincidentally it's exactly the size I needed to fit my little Ryobi uh, biscuit machine and I've got it connected to the uh, system and so we're going to see if uh, if the system is effective on my biscuit machine as well so what I got to do next guys is I got to have three of the boards that are seven and a half inches all right and I'm just going to lay those out now we will be engraving this thing so the goal here is to try to get as little i don't want anything too major going on right in the center because that's where my uh engraving is going to go these are rustic so we don't have to be too particular about that uh they actually prefer it that way uh, but i think what i'm going to do on this one i think i'm going to lay it out this way it's got some really deep dark heart on the other side so i think i'm gonna go with it this way and what i do now is basically in order to put the biscuits in it you just kind of need to have the lines to be able to do so uh, and so i'm just going to ride down through here about every four or five inches i'm putting me a little line they don't have to be evenly spaced these are just to hold these boards together and keep them from twisting and kind of make it into one continual board uh, typically I'll have five or six biscuits across there. So once I get that line in there, uh, the next step of course is to take the machine and put the biscuit holes in there. So I'm gonna go over and turn the dust collection on so that we can try out and see how well it works for that. It's getting way too crowded in here. All right, I'm gonna throw this out there. Uh, that's awesome. Normally when I do these guys, sawdust goes everywhere. Little chips of wood from where that blade buries into these boards and cuts these holes. Those little chips usually just go everywhere. Uh, so even though my, my, my little dust collection system's a little bit of a engineering feat from some redneck engineering and uh, it took a little uh, work I'm digging it so far. All right, this part of the process is uh, it's actually not that hard, guys. You're just gonna need your boards. I recommend a rag, some number 10s, and some glue. Uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is where it starts going downhill now. It, the, work is, the work's getting easier. Oh, somebody forgot to close this glue last time they used it. That's probably not gonna be good. I got lucky. All right, so uh, just applying some glue to this edge right here. You want to try not to get too much of the glue on the, uh, your face of the, the stove cover because I will tell you that it will affect the outcome when you stain these things. So don't get a whole lot on the face if you can help it. Uh, the back side really doesn't matter. Once you sand it a little bit, if there's a little discoloration, it's under the bottom. No biggie. But the face, you definitely don't want to get this stuff on there. Uh, <clears throat> then taking the biscuits here 
and just basically inserting them into the holes made by the little biscuit machine. And I know guys, I, I, I really like my DeWalt tools, uh, but our Home Depot, which is where I wind up, well, I say our, it's actually in the neighboring county. Uh, it's about a 45 minute ride from my house. They usually, if you, if you, they have some DeWalt stuff, but the selection is limited. So stuff like biscuit machines and my latest addition, guys, which is a jig, oh no, scroll saw. I finally got me a scroll saw. I've got my band saw sitting there, but some of the latest designs for charcuterie boards are a little challenging with a bandsaw making those turns and i needed a uh, scroll saw so i picked one of those up while i was there last night uh, because i've got to load up for charcuterie boards for the upcoming fall and christmas season i've got a couple on order already that i gotta make but once you get the glue on both of the edges it should be as simple as long as you followed your lines it should be as simple as lining these things up now sometimes you'll get a board that's got a little twist or something to it and it might be a little harder but typically speaking that is about all you got to do now i got to have a little rubber mallet that i use and this is just a like i said just a little rubber mallet just kind of bump those guys to make sure these lines are lined up and then just, I mean, they typically it don't take much. Uh, then you got to do the other side. This taller board is going to be a little trickier, so I'm going to go ahead and put the glue on the short one first, so I don't have to reach across it. I learned that lesson too, guys. Uh, I, when I first started doing these, I did this one first, and then I reach across. I would reach across to do the other one, and I'd always end up getting glue on my shirt. So avoid that. Just a, little, just a little tip from experience. And yes, I have occasionally gotten a splinter doing this, but they're typically not too bad. Ah, one more. All right. Same scenario. Line up your marks for your biscuits. Make sure everything's lined up, marked like it needs to be. Uh, these little scraps of wood, guys, I was telling you earlier, these little one inch straps that I, or scraps that I'll cut off of these things when I'm making them. The reason that you don't want to throw these guys away is because these make excellent pieces to use when doing your glue up so that you don't scar your wood with the clamps because I'm, I'm bad to clamp. I mean, I, when I clamp, guys, I clamp. Uh, also, the wider pieces are good to use for uh, holding everything flat because when you start putting the torque to these... Uh, clamps what's going to end up happening is they're going to try these boards are going to try to escape all that pressure and when they do i can tell you guys from experience if you clamp this too tight and you don't put something on here when you get this tightened up and it gets just the right amount of force it's going to jump out of there like a jack-in-the-box so that's what these guys are for so I just go in here and uh, put these uh, clamps here across the top of all the boards and i'm not going to tighten them up right now i'm just going to snug them down so they don't fall because i don't want to keep prevent the boards from marrying up the way they need to uh, that'll also hold your little end boards in if you do them right and my ocd makes me offset mine uh, i don't know that that really matters guys but i got those two clamps on there that's just holding everything to keep it from bucking when i get it under pressure uh, and then i'm going to put these Sometimes you may have to put your clamps in different places depending on the boards. Uh, some boards will try to twist or bow, especially if you're getting it where I had to get this at, guys. Uh, so, but typically I'm going to put my clamps right here, maybe a quarter of the way in on, uh, on both sides. Uh, and that typically I get a good, a good even pull. 
and everything marries up the way it's supposed to. So once I get that, uh, once I get both of the clamps in place, guys, all, I, all I'm gonna do now is just go back here and just tighten them up. I'm gonna try to make sure, I'm gonna make sure all my cracks pull up, everything's touching, and once it does that, you really don't have to go any tighter. See this side, this side's touching, everything's pulled up. Uh, cracks are within acceptable margins for something that is considered rustic. Uh, this one's got a little bit of extra, you know, clearance right there. So I'm gonna put a little more pressure on it just to make sure that it closes. Uh, and then, like I said, on the face of the board, I am going to get any of my extra glue off before it dries. But that's pretty much it right there now. I mean, it's both my clamps are tight. Everything looks good. Now I'm gonna tighten these down. And that's that. Gotta wait 24 hours and uh, then we'll be off to sanding. Uh, once I get it sanded, then it will go to engraving. Loving the new camera. <laughs> Not so much the uh, battery capacity of the new camera. So we're going to have to look into doing something different with that, I think. Uh, I have killed it. Or maybe I just need to quit talking so much and start changing batteries more often. But that's it for this part, guys. Like I said, once it dries, what I'll do is I'll break the frames off of it, take all my clamps off. Uh, I'll come back with a straight edge. I'm going to make one cut here. And then I'm going to measure this across, make sure I'm exactly where I want it at my 30 and a half. And I'm going to cut the excess off here and then sand everything and it'll be ready to go into the uh, jig for engraving and it'll get an engrave right here in the middle that'll be the next uh, steps but this is going to be part one of this build guys because i've got to wait 24 hours to do the rest because this has got to dry which a lot of the, the engraving and stuff like that a lot of you guys are familiar with but i'm going to do i'm going to let these dry i'm going to go ahead and knock out I've got, I've got a total of four sets of clamps that I can do. So I'm going to knock out four of these panels today. And then tomorrow, I'll do a video about part two, about how to put the rest of it together. And like I said, guys, if this is something that you're, uh, if you're looking for something in your woodworking shop that requires minimal tools to build and you can uh, get a pretty good return on, th this might be something you want to look at. Because if you can get hooked up with one of these realtors or one of these uh, home construction groups or something like that, that's what I've gotten hooked into, and I can't take on any more customers because they're, the demand's already too high. I, on average, do four of these a week, uh, sometimes more, and it hasn't let up for several months now. So it's simple. You got three boards here, two boards on the outer edges, uh, the measurements. I've gave it, given you the measurements that I use, and that seems everybody seems to be happy regardless of the size of the stove. This works because of my design, the way I do them. The bottom is completely flat, so this will work with glass tops. This will work with gas that has the, 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 the pieces that stick up for the eyes. This will work with the in any stove. As long as you have a decent amount of space that this thing can set flat, it'll work. Now I do, in the end stages of it, you'll see that I put the uh, felt little circulars under the bottom of it and that keeps it from scratching or, you know, the stove or anything like that. And you can put as many of those as you want. I usually just do four, one in each corner and call that done. But uh, that's uh, where we're at so far, guys. So I'm going to put this to the side, knock some more of them out and uh, we'll uh, wrap this up here in just a second. All right, as you can see, guys, it is getting really crowded in here. I've got to get rid of some stuff. I've got to find somewhere to put all this stuff, but I haven't had a chance to really do anything organizational in here much. Uh, like I said, I've had my dust collection system now for probably close to two months, and it's sitting in a box for a month, and then I mounted the uh, blower and everything over there. I went ahead and cut the hole for the wall about a week and a half ago. And then to finally, last night, I took the time because I knew I had all these stove covers to do and I'm getting tired of the, having to deal with all the sawdust. And so I went ahead last night, got me a little bit of plumbing ran. I've got a kit coming to where I can split the hose so I won't have to keep reconnecting it everywhere. Um, and I may clean that up and modify that. I only glued a couple of the fittings on the system but that had to be glued to keep everything from pulling apart. And the reason I did that is in case I get an obstruction in the lines or the hoses, I can actually take it apart without having to cut it. Oh, 
I'm using it for vacuum as opposed to pressurized water. And so if anything, the vacuum should pull the hoses together rather than trying to blow them apart. Uh, the only place is where, where my unit comes down from the, from the ceiling and comes down. I did have to glue that because of the pressure of the hose dangling at that angle was, uh, was going to pull it loose or I felt like it would. And so I went ahead and glued that one fitting. But I'm using the Wynn uh, dust collection system and also got the Wynn uh, air filtration system put in here. And I'm trying to do this to get ready for winter, guys, because it's not that bad out here during the summer when I got the door open and I got my fans going, I got a breeze. But this winter, as it gets cooler and I start running the fireplace, I got this, well, I have my, my stove going over there, heater, whatever you want to call it, uh, and I have the door shut that dust is going to become an issue and my sinuses uh since i've been out here and since i've gotten really into doing a lot of this stuff out here in this closed up environment my sinuses are having a little bit more issues so hopefully the between the the, the dust extraction system and my air filtration system i won't have to wear a mask continually because that's that's where we're headed if i don't watch it is i'm gonna have to start wearing a mask continuously <laughs> and i don't like doing that guys but i hope the video was uh entertaining or uh, informative like i said this is gonna be the part one of it uh tomorrow once we get all these things dried i'll do a part two and like i said if this is something you want to try to do the only real tools you got to have guys of course is a measuring tape pencil you're going to need uh i recommend uh, a chop saw or miter saw uh, you could use a skill saw that's you know if that's what you got to get started and then just start bank rolling, you know, save you some money and buy some more tools as you go. Uh, but a miter saw would definitely be a big difference. It would help a lot. You're gonna need something, whatever it is, if you do get a miter saw, you're gonna need one capable of cutting at least a 10 inch wide board because that's what I use as a one by tens. Because keep in mind guys, it's not a one by 10, it's a one by nine and a quarter if you buy it at the uh, lumber store. And that gives you enough to be able to trim the edges, get the edges nice and flat for glue up, as well as gives you about an inch that you can take and remove a knot, take off a, you know, a split or a damaged part of the wood or whatever in preparation to put them together. Once you get those seven and a half inch wide boards, glue those up, let them dry, and go from there. So the, the miter saw is, is, is preferred, but you could do it with a skill saw. And you could do it with... Uh, whatever kind of saw you got. You can do it with a band saw. You can actually do that part with a table saw. I mean, so if you had a table saw and you could, you could, you could do all of the cuts on a table saw if you had to. Uh, I prefer my, my miter saw because it's just easier, but you could do it with a table saw. But the biscuit machine, I use biscuits. I know a lot of guys don't put biscuits in them, but my fear is that if I don't, the boards are gonna twist and, and turn and it doesn't look like a continual board unless you really pull that thing up tight, clamp it, glue it. And the biscuits to me is just, that's what separates my stove covers a lot of times from these other guys that just throw them together and put screws in them and then you got boards that are mismatched once they, once they get put together. So I prefer this method and then putting the sideboards on, I glue those, put screws in them. You'll see that in part two. But, uh, but like I said, this is a simple project, doesn't require a whole lot of tools that if you have a garage or whatever, you could actually house the tools to do this and make a little extra money. If you couple this small woodworking project with a laser of any kind, uh, and you laser engrave, monogram, whatever you want to call it, the stove covers, that's where the money's at. You know, this cookie cutter stuff that you can get at Home Depot, or not Home Depot, but at Hobby Lobby, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, it's a dime a dozen. But where I make my money is people wanting specific logos, initials, phrases, or whatever on these pieces. And so I make the piece, put the logo on it, and it's 100% custom. And that's, that's what keeps me afloat as far as my, my jobs that I build. So... It's just something food for thought guys and trying to share what I've learned with you guys so that you can kind of like get your business up and going, your hobby, whatever it is. Uh, and, and to me, it's mine started as a hobby and basically I was selling to uh, support my tool addiction because yes, I have a tool addiction. I like tools. I just bought a uh, scroll saw last night. But luckily I've got stove covers that I just collected on my last invoice and so those paid for the new scroll saw. And that's kind of how I've built my operation is I sell products, make money, 
and then reinvested in more tools. I don't run, have, run around with a lot of money in my pocket, guys, but my shop is coming along, and uh, that's what I'm after. So I hope this helps, guys. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, I know subscribers is not really that big of a thing. It's more of an ego type thing, but it does look good, and it does uh, help promote the channel when people are scrolling through and looking. So thanks for stopping by, and have a good day.